privilege to have here and a good friend to many of us here that have become to know uh, Adrian over the years, uh, coming to our different conferences here. But Adrian come down here and he's going to uh, talk with us today uh, about some locks, how to hack locks. And uh, so we'll turn it over to Adrian and uh, hear what he's got to share with us. Thank you much. Well, Paul gave the introduction of who I am, so we'll skip through the next slide very quickly. But the talk you're here to see right now is TSA luggage locks, details, flaws, and making the best of a bad lock. So a little bit about me. I run iongeek.com. Mostly it's videos I post from various conferences I go to, but some of my own research as well, and just little side videos. Uh, I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know anything. Just keep time my hands. If I get something wrong, please let me know, and I'll try to correct it. I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time on my hands. So... A little bit more about me, I work for TrustedSec, I'm a senior information security consultant there, and I'm also one of the co-founders of DerbyCon. Now, thanks to a whole lot of people who are in this list for helping research uh, this talk, uh, I started posting about TSA locks and trying to duplicate the keys, I want to say sometime this last summer, and a lot of other people joined in on it, like Doc Sim provided some pictures, Deviant all of them, and his uh, girlfriend Lady Merlin. Um, showed some uh, pictures to me as well that they found. Johnny Christmas has been helping with uh, Xylitol to uh, do the 3D printed keys. And uh, a couple other people like, uh, I hope I'm, I can't pronounce that handle whatsoever, but uh, Winklikiaskia uh, also helped with finding some pictures. And Dossman is my lock mentor. I should also mention Night Owl is involved in the mix. He's doing a lot of work with, um, uh, I think it's the TSA 001s and uh, also the Safe Skies luggage locks. Anyway, why this talk? First of all, why not this talk? Some people get people to talk about, well, why would you even want to give a talk about the TSA locks? They're pretty well known in the um, lockpick community that they're crap. But, um, yes, they're easy to rake open, and yes, baggage is easy to open other ways. There's a trick where you can go in through the zipper with a, a big pin, shove it in there, open it up, then if it's... If the lock is set before you can move the lock, because it's put between two zippers, you can grab it and just go... And close the uh, zip closure back together. But um, I do have reasons I want to talk about it. While Lockput knows these locks are crap, I haven't seen a whole lot of people do talks on it until relatively recently. Also, it's an interesting technical challenge to go into a lock, take it apart, and then be able to reproduce the key by reverse engineering it. Also, um, some people made a big deal about that photo being leaked a while back. Uh, technically, we can always reproduce the keys without the photo because we can own the locks. If you physically own the lock, you can take it apart and figure it out. And also, it's a good abject lesson in why security for obscurity fails. A lot of people have been making comparison recently to um, how the government wants various crypto backdoors put in place. And they think that somehow that's going to ensure them to be able to monitor things but still keep things secure for people. And that kind of technique really just doesn't work in any kind of practical real-world way. So it's a great illustration for that. So what are TSA-approved locks? Way back in 2003, January 1st, the TSA demanded they be able to inspect all luggage going through airports, including you know, check bags and such. So if people had locked the baggage, the TSA would have to break the lock to be able to examine it or it wouldn't necessarily get on a plane. So they started clipping a lot of locks. This pisses off a lot of flyers, as you can imagine. So that's when they started adopting it. Uh, two people came up with standards, which we'll talk about in a second. As far as the standards are concerned, though, Canada has similar standards. Actually, as far as um, countries go, I think Israel has also adopted it, maybe France and Australia. But um, the Canadian TSA has adopted this as well as of April 2014, it seems. Or at least started um, talking about it. Uh, and now they're recognized. The same ones, the travel centers and the safe skies are used there. Okay. Here's a little bit about um, the Canadian locks. The Canadians actually have a little bit better policy on this. My understanding is before they break your lock, they're supposed to try to get a hold of you so you can come unlock it, and then they can let it pass through as opposed to just cutting your lock off. But if they can't find you, uh, they'll get someone who's a representative of the airline instead to break it. So it's not the government agent breaking your stuff. It's someone from the airline. Okay. Hey, two di different, um, let's say, brands of... Uh, TSA lock. Well, I guess maybe it's standards because the first one, Travel Century, this came from uh, John Vimalai. Anyway, he used to be a consultant for uh, baggage handling, and 
way back, I think even up in the 70s, it was well known that it was a certain set of keys you could have that would open up common brands of luggage. And people started, people who had handled baggage collected these so that if you, let's say someone left the bag at the airport, well, you couldn't leave it there and not have anybody collect it and not know what's in it. So they'd be able to examine it. So keychains of common keys started to develop way back as far as the 70s. You see other places that have a similar um, setup where people will collect elevator keys because for a certain make and model of elevator, it's always the same key. So they started making these sets and he actually started talking to the TSA about, well, how about I make you a set of the most common keys? And that eventually turned into, how about we make up standards for common keys? And they don't manufacture their own locks, Travel Century doesn't. However, they oversee other people who manufacture them to certain standards. And people like Brinks and uh, Master Lock and so forth started making ones by that standards. Safe Skies, at around about the same time, also had a similar idea and started talking to the TSA. And they put in patents first, but only because it seems that they knew Travel Century was getting into it also. And then they started suing each other back and forth over rights and such, where I'm still not sure how that all has um, settled out as of yet. But um, Safe Skies seems to make their own locks. Some better than others, um, but the ones you're going to find most commonly in stores are the Travel Century ones, which you'll see with this little diamond logo. Now, a lot of the recent interest in TSA locks and keys came because someone leaked pictures online of them. Some of the first ones were like this particular picture where someone's looking at the key ring. And from just the key, the key ring and looking at the key, you can find out something about it. With the way locks work, at least pin tumbler locks, is there are certain numbered cuts. of, And let's say the larger the number, the deeper the depth of the cut. And you can reproduce a key by key code saying this is a 3, 4, 6, 1 key. And that's to be the cuts in them. And by looking at a picture of it, you can get a good idea what the key looks like, and if you can find the right blank, you might be able to file one on your own. There's also services online that will duplicate keys for you if you take a picture of it and send it in. That said, they can't duplicate any old key if they don't have a blank for it. And most of these ones, it takes a little hunting around to um, find the blank, and they're not like common house, house key blanks. Um, actually, uh, only one of them is a semi-common uh, padlock blank. So the, taking a photo and then sending it in, you really can't do it, especially with a shot like that, because it's not really head-on. Uh, other key pictures also got leaked. This one's a lot better for giving us information about the kinds of uh, kind of biddings that they will have. And um, finally, there's a bunch of pictures that came out that look like they're directly from Travel Century documents of the keys. And these things are very much front-on, taking measurements of them. You can actually try to make 3D printed uh replicas of them, which a lot of people have done with mixed results. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Now, I've been researching through patents for various TSA locks, and here's the relevant patents, so you can actually go in and look up uh, information about how that particular lock works. It doesn't necessarily have the bidding, but it gives you some information. Also, I collected some information about the different designers of the lock that people originated with, based on those court documents from people suing each other back and forth, as um, well as an article that another gentleman wrote back in, I want to say 2004. I think I'll have his name up here in a second. And he collected like the names of people who were developing it. Also, sometimes I could find them in patents. The only one of the TSA locks, by the way, which I would put any kind of faith in whatsoever, is the TSA 006, which we'll cover in a bit. And that one was designed by Avis. So it came from a little bit more quality co lock company. Now, functionality-wise, the way these TSA locks generally work is either you have a master key system where you have a key and the TSA has a key, or you have a system where you open up via combination lock, via combination, and they open up via key. So, to give you an idea of how that works, here is a dual function lock where you have a dial on one side for putting in a combination, and on the other you have a core for the key, and it will also unlock the lock. So what a TSA agent will do is they'll use this side, and you'll use this other side. Now, one flaw of this particular kind of lock, it's sometimes referred to as a Sesame-style lock, even though Sesame didn't make this particular one to a particular uh, company, is the way the dials work, you can actually put in something called a decoding knife down into the lock, and be able to decode what it is. And I'm going to show you a decoding knife here in a second. I'm trying to find a decent lock 
to show that on. All right, let me switch poacher here. Like this is a decoding knife right here. It's a very thin piece of metal, and you can basically go in and feel for these irregularities. Now, those irregularities are the gates. Once you find a gate, you stop, then you get the next one and line it up also, gate to gate to gate to gate through all the dials. Once you got them all locked, you turn each one evenly because it's one of those 10 combinations that's going to open it, or maybe one of those 26, however the lock is set up. So you greatly reduce the key space, and you're able to open it up just by going in with a little knife and feeling for it. And it might take me a while to decode one, but it generally doesn't take too awful long, and that's one way into this style of lock. I can probably give demos later on, like during a break or in Lockpick Village. Now, a lot of the ones, as far as the core of the lock, is going to be a wafer lock. Wafer locks work on the principle of you have a bunch of wafers that have to be properly aligned and pulled out of the outer cylinder for you to be able to turn the key. And if you don't have the proper key in, in theory, you can't actually turn the lock. The bad thing about most wafer locks is while people can make good wafer locks, most wafer locks are, uh, in general, pretty crappy. And I don't remember if I actually have a wafer lock in this particular baggie. Well, that's unfortunate because it appears I do not have one in this bag. Anyway, this is the basics of how a wafer lock looks, though. Just once you put the right key in, it lifts up all the wafers to the right height, pulls them out of these channels at the bottom of the keyway, at the bottom of the cylinder, and you can turn the lock. Now, you can master a wafer lock. It's a little weird, though. Um, normal uh, wafer lock might have the wafers looking something like this. However, a mastered wafer lock has basically two sides to it. One side is the side the TSA's keys go into, and then there's a mirror image of it where your key goes into it. For example, the blue and the purple is used by the user key. The red and the purple might be used by the TSA key. And the wafer in it has two heights on it so that you have two different keys. And depending on which keyway you go through, it still lifts that particular wafer to the right height. And uh, to give you an example of one that's uh, like that, this particular one, you see there's two different sides to the keyway. Well, this is the TSA side over here. And on this side, is the user side. I don't know if you can see where my mouse is pointing. Now I have a bunch of example locks and I thought I had, um, oh, somehow it skipped right past this one. Now that's how you master key a wafer lock. You can also master key a pin tumbler lock and that's done in this particular way. Normally the way a pin tumbler lock works is you have a spring, a driver pin, and a key pin. And the idea behind lock picking it would be to lift on this key pin so you have the driver pin just above the shear line, and what you're doing is you're applying the slightest bit of tension to it so that it can't fall down because you formed the ledge. And I'll do a quick illustration of that since this talk I have the time to, to do it. Let me see if I can... Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Maybe this one will work well. I have enough room in there to actually move it. Now... If you look in there, you can see how the pins are lined up. They're not all lined up evenly with the shear line, of course. I'm going to overlift a whole bunch of them so you can see them. Let me see. Actually, let me pull out the tension tool so it's easier to show. You see at the bottom, those are the key pins. When you get it lined up exactly at the shear line, you can actually turn the core of the lock, and it will operate mechanisms in the back, like those locking dogs, which, by the way, this is going to be important later on to show you, which with some of these things, when you have an open keyway to the back of the lock, I don't know why I'm focusing on the microphone instead, when you have an open keyway to the back of the lock, you can actually get in there and start pulling aside those locking dogs. And you don't even have to um, pick the lock. You can bypass it by just reaching a tool into the back and moving those. If it has a ball bearing system, you can't do that because there's no nowhere for the ball bearing to move. Anyway, the idea behind picking is to apply a light bit of tension and what you're doing is essentially forming a ledge between that core and the outer cylinder. And you can feel through for what pin is binding and lift it just above. And if you do it right and apply light bit of tension, you may feel the plug move ever so slightly. And with a little time and effort, you can figure out how to pick a lock fairly reliably. 
Uh, this one just happens to be a really easy one to pick, especially since it's clear. But it's good for illustrating the principle of how a pin tumbler lock works. Wafer locks are usually easier just to rake open. Um, they're usually not well made. Now, the way a master key works is, besides just having the two pins, the key pin and the driver pin, you also have a little piece in the middle, confusingly called a wafer. Uh, the, way, the term wafer is used multiple times in, in locksmithing for referring to different things. Kind of like Mac, Mac address, uh, Mac has encryption algorithms and uh, ensuring someone hasn't modified something, Mac is in a Macintosh. Well, I got a new Mac for you. Maximum adjacent cut. How big a difference you can have between one height from the key to the next height of the key and still have the key be functional. Because you have too great a difference, you shove the key in, it gets jammed in there too easily and you can't pull it back out. Anyway, the way a master keyed system works is they add this little wafer in the middle between the pins so there's two different heights you can lift it to. So you can have one key that's a master to open any door in a building and another key that won't. That only opens certain doors. The problem with master keying systems like this is it does make it a little easier to rake open because there's multiple combinations you could happen to fall on while you're raking the lock to be able to make it pop. And that's the master wafer system we talked about already. Now here is a bunch of different uh, locks and uh, common keyways you'll find out there. This one you won't find anymore. Uh, I know a few people have TSA 001s. For the longest time this was the only one I couldn't find until uh, uh, Jay going down in Texas. Uh, I happened to be at his lockpick village for um, HUSETCON and I was playing around and was like, oh, this looks like a 007, I'm going to try this. Wait, my key doesn't work. I look at it and finally find 001. As far as I can tell, no one makes the 001 anymore. I can't seem to find it in any stores. I've been out looking all over the place. I've been When I go visit uh, some other state, I go looking. So I think they've discontinued it. But um, its key essentially looks like this. And um, we haven't quite figured out the proper blank for it. Um, there's a few that almost work. I know um, uh, Night Owl, he was able to uh, get, I believe it was the uh, 1092VR from Ilco to work if he filed down the sides. We're both pretty sure that there was a Chinese lock company called Tricircle that probably makes the blank we need, but we can't find any place to really order it in a reasonable amount, so we don't order like a bulk order of a few hundred dollars worth of blanks and then find out none of them are useful. But we think it's probably tricircle. Anyway, you're not going to encounter it too much anymore and it's still going to be an easy one to pick. The TSA 002, it is, well, effectively an Ilco 1611R. There's also a JMA blank FC1, uh, S1D that seems to match it. Now you see it's a double-sided key, but it's the same on either side. This is called a convenience key so that you can flip it around and it still works. Uh, either way, so it doesn't matter which way you put it in. Another nice thing about the 002 and the 007 I'll show in a bit is since it's double-sided, it's going to wear longer. You have two different sides you're slowly wearing down as opposed to one side that wears down. So that helps increase reliability somewhat. And the 002, no problem. I can find the blanks for it. And it's the second most popular key. So eh, the security 002 is pretty much completely shot. Not that it wasn't earlier on because um, some of these are so bad you can open them with a pair of toenail clippers. Um, hmm. And the keyway for it looks much like this. And I've been reproducing these keys and giving them out to people at conferences for probably six months now. The TSA 003, you don't uh, wind into too much. Uh, it's fairly simple. It's not a hard one to pick if you can tension it right. This open keyway at the bottom makes it a bear to actually tension. But uh, you'll see it occasionally, not very often. By the way, to my knowledge, I'm the only person I know that actually owns all the different keyways. Because <laughs> some, like the 3 and the 1, it's just really hard to find. And the 6, which I'll be talking about in a bit, it's easy to find, but it's really expensive. Because you usually have to buy like $500 pieces of luggage from uh, Ramoa to get it. The 004 is the most pathetic one I think I've ever seen. It is essentially a bulbous screwdriver. It is pretty pathetic. Um, now, some of them come with uh, extra mechanisms to keep you from, uh, to at least let you know someone's been into your lock. And I'm trying to see if I have one in my little bin here. I thought I'd at one time put one of every keyway in this, but that looks like it's probably not the case. Oh, I do have a better illustration of how a wafer lock works though, which I may pull out in a second. Okay, I am not seeing OK, 
can I didn't bring that one with me. Anyway, essentially all it is is a screwdriver. If you care of a normal lock pick set, there's something called a ball pick, which you can probably put in there and just turn it and it will open right up. It is pretty sad. Some have um, detection mechanisms where they'll pop up a little red marker to show you, hey, someone's been inside your lock. But those can also be reset if you do the right things by reaching in through one of the dials on the lock and pushing the flag back. A lot of flagging mechanisms are usually pretty pathetic. So um, actually, let me give you an illustration of some of that right here. This lock right here, remember I was mentioning wafer locks? This here is a wafer lock. And as you can see, there's these little wafers that come down and are currently pushing against that rectangular piece of metal. They're kind of down in it, and so you can't turn the lock. However, if you have the appropriate key for it, you can put that key in. What it does is, if it doesn't overlift it, it pulls them all out of the channel, and then hopefully you can turn it and then open the lock. Now this one has a little detection mechanism you can see. Uh, since I used the key, it pushed up this little flag to show that I've been in it. But let's say that wasn't the case. Let's put this thing back together. Yes, this is the keychain I carry with me every day. Okay, so put it back together and if I use the combination, I'd be able to reset it back to its default state. And assuming no one's changed the combination on this, okay, let's see, zero, 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 and it looks like in the process of messing around with it, it has been busted. play with it just a little bit more. Anyway, this particular style of lock, if you have one, you can pick it and then it won't actually lift that flag. Because for that flag to get lifted up, the full key has to go into the keyway to push up the flag. But if you pick it, you can avoid that entire process and you won't know if someone's actually been inside the luggage. So that's the 004. 004 is um, very pathetic. Now, the 006, and I think I stepped one too far. This is the toughest one I've personally encountered. It is interesting because it's a dimple key. Uh, a dimple key is essentially, with a dimple lock, the same as a pin tumbler, but instead of having the bidding on the edge of the key, it's on the sides of the key. I've yet to find the proper blank for it. This is the one made by Avis, and for the longest time, none of us could pick it. I think Devin was trying to pick one of mine. Dossman tried to pick one of mine. Um, uh, Babic of uh, uh, Tool, he has, uh, in the core group, he has uh, luggage from Ramoa, and he'd been trying to pick it and having problems. So I basically thought it was unpickable. Then I was up in Canada f a few months ago, and this gentleman was able to sit there, and he applied light bit of tension and kind of diddled the pins with a Bogota rave rake and was able to get it open. And after he showed me what can actually be done, I was able to do it too. And I'm pretty sure I have an example of the 006 here with me. And I'll very easily see it on this small little camera. But as you can see, the pin... Oh, no, you can't see it that way. There's little pins inside there. And you have to press those up to just the right height. And for a while there, this is the only one I knew of that was hard to pick. And it's still the hardest of them to pick. But you can achieve it. We haven't really worked on a good 3D printed keys of these yet because it's hard to measure those depths. When I get a second model, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tear this one apart, take measurements, and then reproduce it. But I'm still waiting for someone on eBay to put up um, another replacement lock. This one came as part of a replacement lock package you're supposed to put in your remote luggage if you'd already broken it. I have seen anybody put up just the lock for quite a while, and I'm not going to spend 500 bucks on a piece of luggage just to get the, the lock. My dedication to research does not go quite that far. Okay, the 007, this is by far the most common. Again, it's a double-sided keyway. Uh, we've been looking around for the right key blank to do it with. Um, 
the 1092 VR can somewhat work if you mill down both sides. And the problem is a lot of 007s, the amount of space you have in the keyway varies so much from lock to lock. And we haven't had a whole lot of luck uh, finding a key blank that works in all of them. Again, I'm pretty sure um, a uh, tricycle key blank will do it if we can find it. But it's a Chinese brand that you don't necessarily find key blanks for here in the U.S. It's, I've been looking around various, ordering various ones from a, a locksmith supplier I use and haven't had a whole lot of luck. The way I have had luck though is those two brands of um, lock that you can get either at Target or Myers. Inbox from Target or Travel Smart Con Air from Myers. And if you get one of these, well they have a key that's almost exactly perfect. You just have to file it down a little bit more in a few places and you can create the 007 which again is the most common. Here's the different uh, TSA 007 keyways. There's all sorts of variants, and they come in different thicknesses, so it's kind of difficult. But um, you can reduce them by buying those particular uh, locks and then messing around with the keys. Now, traditional ways in, I explained a little bit how picking works before, but here's another illustration. Remember how I said the, the goal was to lock a pin up on the ledge? Well, that's what I'm doing right here. By applying a little bit of tension to that core, you can form a ledge, and then get the driver pin to sit on top of it. That's single pin picking. Raking is essentially putting a tool in, trying randomly to move in and out, and get the pins in the right position, and going through a bunch of different combinations. You've probably seen, if you've done anything at a lockpick village before, a wave rake looks something like this. The idea is when you go into the lock, and you're jiggling it up and down, pulling in and out, you're basically simulating a bunch of potential key cuts, and eventually, Hopefully, you'll be able to hit on the right combination. So picking and raking is usually pretty easy. Most of them, especially since a lot of them are wafer locks, and wafer locks usually have bad tolerances. There's also bumping a lock. Bumping a lock is essentially where you put a key in, pull it out that's been taken down to the lowest levels for each key cut by whatever the standard is for that particular type of lock. Apply a little bit of tension, take the key out one notch, slam it into the lock, and what it does is, for kinetic force, hits the key pins, throws the driver pins up above the shear line, key pins fall down first, and then for a brief moment, you can hopefully turn the lock. You can't always reliably do this. On TSA keys, uh, TSA locks, generally, most of them are going to be wafer locks, so you can't really do this. Um, some you might potentially be able to do it, but uh, it's probably easier just and more reliable just to pick them. There's also something that some people refer to as shiving. That's where you manipulate the locking dog inside the lock without actually picking the lock. I was trying to illustrate that sort of with my uh, transparent lock I had out here a second ago, but um, I don't think I could quite get it across. I'm looking for the lock I had out here a moment ago, and I seem to have placed it in the wrong location. You can tell I have a whole lot of locks. There we go. Yet, yeah. the idea behind shiving a lock is you reach in and those are these locking dogs. This one has one on both sides. And if you reach in correctly, you can get the pins out of your way, press against them, and you see how I'm pulling that one down? Well, no, you can't really see it on camera easily. Anyway, there's one locking dog that I'm able to pull out of the way and manipulate. Well, a lot of these TSA locks, they may only have one side where there's a locking dog. So what you see in this illustration is me reaching into the lock, pulling the side on this locking dog, and getting it out of the way. So this is the most expensive TSA lock I currently have in my possession. This is from Louis Vuitton. I spent 40 bucks on this lock. Don't ask why. It was a weird lock. Um, and it has a few major problems. One of those being that you can get it open by reaching in through the back of the lock, and if you get the right spot, you just pull aside the locking dog inside of it, and you're able to make it pop. Like that. So it's uh, pretty pathetic. Most, this is the most expensive TSA lock I currently have. I have a few more on order which um, use Bluetooth. And that goes into my next project I might talk a little bit about. Um, but yeah, some of these locks are pretty easy to shiv open. Just reach in there, 
cool side the locking dog. You can also do that with a lot of other better locks, like the mass lock number three, which isn't really a good lock, but it's better than most TSA locks. Some of those are prone to um, attack via this me method, but you have to use two tools. Um, both Sparrows and Peterson make something um, called, uh, I think Peterson's version is called the Silver Bullet, and uh, ma uh, Sparrows is called the Master Switch, where you can reach into a, some full-size locks and actually do similar techniques. As far as shimming most of these locks, shimming is a fun technique, which I'll, well, I'll illustrate what that is. This is a $60 Bluetooth-enabled lock, which you can also open via RFID. And it's crap. Um, the biggest problem with this one is they designed it very poorly from the standpoint of making sure you couldn't easily bypass it. Now, it uses those locking dogs, like I mentioned before, much like this. With these, you can actually reach through the opening around the shackle and push aside those spring-loaded locking dogs. If you had something that used ball bearings like this one right here, you wouldn't be able to do that because there's nowhere for the ball bearings to go. So if we take this lock and work on it like this, we just um, get ourselves a shim. These ones are made out of a strong piece of plastic. They, call, they sell it as Neomeat off of... Um, some Chinese sites. I've also seen uh, people sell it as mica sheets and um, a few other names. You wedge them in there and basically you're pushing aside those locking dogs and you can open the lock. So I didn't have to hack Bluetooth for that, didn't have to hack RFID, you just do that. Now as far as TSA locks are concerned though, probably not so likely because you have such small locks usually, you're not going to have enough space to get down in there. So Probably not a practical attack for most TSA locks, but it's still a fun one to play around with. Also, those jigglers, there's a set of, um, there's different sets people sell. This one happens to be the coffin keys from Sparrows, and what they have is various different cuts in them of, <sighs> that are known to work in locks fairly well. And what you do is you put them in there and they become your tension tool and your pick at the same time. You just jiggle them there and open them. And with some crappy TSA locks, especially anything that's a wafer lock, you can have some pretty good luck with those. There's also decoding, like I tried to mention before. Here's one of the locks disassembled. And you can actually feel for where those gates. And if you feel the gates properly and you line them all up, you're hopefully able to figure out the code for lock and get it open. Again, this that little notch right there. That's one of those gates we're feeling for. Just get them all lined up then turn evenly on all the dials, and one of those 10 combinations should be the correct combination. It's also making keys. Since I can take apart a lock, what I do is, well, I'll show you the process in a bit. Uh, you can do it somewhat from the photo. Getting an idea of what the key looks like helps some about how deep you're going to have to make the cut, but it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, un online key duplicators, probably aren't going to have the bl proper blank form if you send them a picture. Also, if they recognize it as a TSA key, they probably won't make it for you. So here's the what I did. I went out and bought me a bunch of different TSA locks and started tearing them apart. I have little baggies here full of TSA locks that I've used for tearing apart and measuring it. I took out the wafer of the lock, sorry, the, the wafer lock inside of it, the core, that you see on the left here. By the way, this is another one of those locks, since you can reach to the back of the keyway as I understand it, I think this is one of them, you can move that locking dog out of the way pretty easy. Anyway, for key blanks, I haven't been able to find a proper blank I can mass source. I would like to be able to mass produce these and hand them out to people at cons, but um, so far I haven't found a good blank. But uh, Travel Sentry and Embark from Target and Myers respectfully, uh, they, sorry, Embark and um, Travel Smart, those two brands of uh, locks come with keys which you can file down. For instance, you see the one on the right? That's an unmodified key. The one on the left is a modified key. So if a little bit of modification, you can make a 007 key that works in practically every 007 lock I've ever encountered. So here's what those particular packagings look like. And usually the lock's like four or five bucks, and you might get four keys out of it. Still a little bit expensive if you want to mass produce them. So what I do is I take the core out of the lock, and I put the key in, and I see what the heights are. Then once I find out the heights are, any place where the, it's too high, by the way, I should go back a second. This particular lock is not the one that the key came for. The key came with one of the other brands of locks. The key came with either the Embark or the Travel Smart 
from Con Air. This one happens to be that Brink slot I took apart earlier. Notice how all the wafers are out and it would get in the way of this little channel. Wouldn't be able to turn it. Well, I put in my almost key blank and I do some measurements. As you can see, it looks like it perfectly or almost perfectly lifted that wafer to the correct height. It way overlifted this wafer, way overlifted this wafer, and overlifted this one just a little bit. So you get out a file and start filing it. And um, Devin from the tool group sent me a really nice Pippin file. I mean, it's a $70 or so file. I don't know why they cost that much, but it's really nice. And you can use it to file down your key to just the right depth. And you put it in again, measure and look and say, okay, I need to get a little bit more. And you just do that slowly over time, a little, you know, little bit by little bit, and you're able to reproduce the key. So doing that, that's how I made my initial key. And then I just started reproducing them on my key duplicator I bought. Um, there's also the 3D printed ones out there. The problem is a lot of them don't work, and they may not work in all locks. You gotta remember that a lot of these TSA locks have very loose tolerances, so a key that might work, that's 3D printed and works in one, let's say, 007 lock, may not work in a different 007 lock. But I know Johnny has been working on this, and uh, XYL2K, and, and several other people. I think Xylitol was the first person to uh, put out uh, a 3D printed set. But they're still working on sizes, to my knowledge, and there's a lot of breakage. But if you want to see the repository, it's out there on GitHub. Now, as far as future lock research, more stuff I want to look into. There is um, other people putting out ideas for travel locks, like clip lock. The idea behind this is you can actually cut the shackle and then move the shackle in some more and have another spot where it locks in. So the TSA agent would literally cut your lock as long as you cut in the right spot, examine your stuff, put the shackle back in and lock it again. And you can buy replacement shackles if they wear out. Uh, I have my doubts about how good of an idea this is. Also, you notice it still has the combination, so you can probably still do the decoding attack. Standing Concepts has a similar idea, and uh, here they have this little replaceable piece that you can screw out for different locking positions, and it can be locked and cut and locked and cut a certain number of times before you have to replace that inner core. Airbolt, and there's a different company whose name escapes me, they're working on a Bluetooth lock. I'm just one of the Kickstarter people on this, and I've been trying to consult with them. They haven't said what kind of TSA keyway they're going to have yet, but from information they gave me, they said that, well, actually what they said was TSA is only licensing the 007 and 006 anymore. Technically, it wouldn't be the TSA. It would be Travel Century. But this thing has a bunch of extra features. One, it's Bluetooth enabled. It's supposed to tell you where all your lock has been if via crowdsourced uh, phone apps, because that's going to rely on enough people having this type of lock to that to be practical. It has a proximity alarm to go off if someone like grabs your luggage while you're in the bathroom and starts going off with it. There's a whole lot of interesting features, and I've ordered it, and I'll probably, hopefully, be talking about it, <sighs> probably not by the tech, my next talk, because I don't think I'm actually going to get shipped it for a while, but um, it looks interesting. I've been trying to convince them to go with the 006. It's probably going to be costing them more, because we we'll assume the Avis is going to charge them more to license it. But it's going to be a lot better than if they use the 007, which is totally blown by this point. Here's some other various random stuff about TSA locks. Uh, key code. I noticed that certain um, American Tourist locks I could buy in Walmart had the key code written on the outside of the lock. So if I can ever find the proper blank I, and figure out what co uh, standard they're using, I might be able to duplicate some TSA keys from that. This one wouldn't be the right number, but... At least it shows me that maybe there is a right number I can find. Um, by the way, if anybody helps to find a, a key bank that works in all 007s, let me know. Some people watch this video online and let me know whether or not you found something that functions. I've gone through various key blank directories, looked, ordered a whole bunch of blanks. So far, nothing has been quite perfect. Oh, as far as law is concerned, I've heard people say um, you cannot legally duplicate the TSA keys. Not that I've seen. I haven't seen any laws that actually say you cannot. Uh, do not duplicate in general in locksmithing is more of a suggestion than a law. The only laws we've actually found on it, well, there's patents. Um, for instance, if uh, a company owns the rights to a certain key blank, they may have a copyrighted key blank or a patented key blank for a certain amount of time. That would be right to them, patented. So no one else can produce it. That's one way they could legally protect it. Also, there's laws about mailbox locks and duplicating the keys for it and DOD locks. But I haven't found anything about uh, TSA locks, Travel Century and Safe Skies being illegal to duplicate. Also, I like to troll occasionally online, if you know me at all. So I once asked, uh, hey, Master Lock US, I want to duplicate the key for my 
4683Q luggage lock. Which blank do I tell lock locksmith to use? Thanks. To maintain the integrity of TSA oversight of the TSA accepted system, dupe keys aren't available on TSA locks. Sorry. Yeah, not so much. I, I don't... Mm. Anyway, I'd like to get the chance to visit the factory at some point in time. But, uh... Meet the hospital member about that. Anyway, more information about uh, TSA keys. I have an article I wrote from the company I work for that's out on Trusted Sex site. Dark Sim has a timeline of the various people doing research on this. Uh, there's also a report on TSA approved luggage locks by Mark Weber Tobias. He's the gentleman I got a lot of the information from about which particular company originally designed that particular type of lock. And also, Dev, Devin Olive has a. Dev, sorry. Yeah, Dev, Devin Olive, I pronounced it right, I'm pretty sure. Uh, has a write up on his company's website as well. And then, quick announcement DerbyCon, the dates, as I recall, are September 20th. Through the 26th, only the last like, three days of that is the actual con part. The earlier days are the trainings and so forth. And um, I'm gonna move on to qu actually let's move on to questions. Are there any questions? Any questions? You go mm -hmm. All right. In that case, I'm gonna talk about my next project I want to play with, and I already alluded to it a little bit. I've been ordering various Bluetooth locks. Now this is the one that I uh, opened earlier with shims, it's a quick lock. And all these locks, this one happens to be opened by an RFID card also, you just press the button to activate it, and then run the card next to it, or you can press the button and use your phone app over Bluetooth to be able to unlock it. Now I have, oh, it's, yeah, over on the left hand side, as I'm seeing it, you can uh, hopefully see three different apps towards the bottom, that I'll use for opening the various locks I have. The Quick Lock app, you just have the lock and discovery mode, which you do by pressing the button, and then hopefully once it opens and sees it, you can click unlock, a little motor and lock, moves aside those locking dogs and you can open it up. But as we saw before, this one is easy to shim open, so I can't recommend it, especially since they're all about 60 to 70 bucks. The next one up, I think is really cool, but I need to work on the software more. This is the Noke. The nice thing about it is it uses a ball bearing on one side. And you can't really shim that. Now, someone online has told me, Legion, I think it's Legion 303, that he opened his with a magnet because the actuator inside of it, the thing that moves so the ball bearing has room, apparently is ferrous metal. And you can get it to move with a magnet. I have yet to successfully open one with a magnet. He says he broke his while he was trying to move one with a magnet, but he did get it open. Now, this one's neat because you can also take it apart. Once you unlock it, you can screw this back plate off, undo some screws, and eventually get to the inside sides of the lock and play around with it, which is nifty. If I actually want to find all the chips that are in it, I could easily reverse engineer this one. Uh, and it's not too bad a lock, other than it's definitely the prettiest of all the Bluetooth locks I found out there, but its biggest problem is the software is cruddy. Uh, it has a tendency to not work until you shut Bluetooth off and then back on again. Uh, maybe it's the Bluetooth on my phone, I don't know. The way you activate it is you press down and you get an option to unlock it on your phone. You hit unlock and it moves the actuator side so you can get the ball bearing out of the way and open the lock. This thing it has a battery inside it, a little coin cell to keep it um, powered up whenever you push down the shackle. If you happen to have that battery die, you can undo this bottom plate, put a coin cell against it, and get power for long enough to be able to open the lock. Also, this lock has a manual override where you can press it for short or long amount of time, you know, blue or white, and it's like a Morse code code you can put into it to get the lock to open. I don't recall what that is off the top of my head right now, but that's a different way into this particular lock. This one is the outdoor version of Master Lock's Bluetooth lock, which I'm also going to do some research on. This one doesn't use ball bearings exactly, it uses rollers, but you still can't shim it. Uh, think of a ball bearing, but as a, instead make it look like a rolling pin. Uh, you actually found patents online that I think give me the idea of what the insides of this look like. I'm still trying to open this thing without doing it destructively and haven't succeeded. Uh, I'm going to be getting hopefully a Ubertooth 1 from a Martin Boss before long and uh, testing out it and seeing if I can figure out if the uh, challenge response system it uses for unlocking from your phone is decent or not. But much like all the other ones, you press this to activate, and currently my phone is in 
so my uh, app on my phone is in locker mode. So this lock will not open instantaneously. I have to go into Master Lock's little application and bring it up and manually do it. Ready to be opened. There we go. When it's in locker mode, just having the phone in near proximity won't open it. But when it's not in locker mode, you just have to get close to it with your phone and it automatically knows to unlock. You probably don't want it in locker mode most of the time because we don't know how close you're going to be. There's something people are using to, to jack into cars. I think it's a form of um, amplification attack where someone may be inside their house with their keys and it's far enough away from the car that the car can't read the key and automatically open the door because some modern cars apparently have automatically unlocking doors. So what they, these people do is they use an amplifier that sends the challenge response for a greater distance to the person's key that's inside the house and opens up. In theory, I'm pretty sure I can get something like that to work with this if I can do it with Bluetooth. And this one also has a manual override uh, where you have to press up and down, up, down, left, right. So it's like a Konami code. So I think it's up, down, right, right, right. Well, I just opened. That's because my phone app is still on. But that's the way this one opens. And un unfortunately, I can't actually completely take apart because it is uh, riveted together. But I've been thinking about drilling out those rivets so I can actually do it. Oh, if the battery inside dies, you can put a little 9 volt there to charge it up long enough to be able to actually open the lock. And if you're wondering why I'm wearing, wearing this bandage on my finger, I found out the hard way, and I should have read the instructions, you can't unturn this screw until you unlock the lock. And in the process of doing this, I had a multi-tool close my finger. So I bleed from my locksmithing. Anyway, this is so far the most secure one I think I've found from a standpoint of the shackles held in both sides, the shackles more substantial, and um, just haven't found a way of opening it yet non-destructively. So I'm going to be working on that one a little bit more, and I'm also going to be working on the software. I'm kind of interested in what some of these locks show. Like this one, if I, uh, uh, if I fail to open it several times, it actually sends me an email via my phone app that someone tried to mess with your lock. This one actually gives me geotag information about where the lock was used and if someone failed to open it before. So that's all kind of nifty. With the software you can add, I think the features of Bluetooth locks are interesting, though mm, in the end probably a bad idea. <laughs> uh, but um, <coughs> anyway, that's my next area of research. But that's all I have. Is there any questions on anything? So a, a standard directional lock, you would just shim? Depends. Um, I don't actually own one of those directional locks. I need to go buy one because we actually had, um, we were in a game for a company retreat and we were having problems with one because we didn't know how the reset system works because none of us owned that particular one. Uh, you might be able to shim it. If it's anything like the modern master lock dial locks, you can't shim it because they've added an extra sh piece of shaping to the shackle where the um, locking dog comes in and you can't push it aside. So you might be able to shim it. I don't personally own one of those dial ones because you can't well, you can't um, pick it because there's no key way to pick. So I'm not sure. But, yeah, that would be the first thing I'd probably try to attack it. Any other questions? All right. Well, I thank you for your time. And if anybody wants to play with some locks, we have some next door.